I'm hoping to see some of the Dipper's characteristic courtship display. And you can see that wing movement is phenomenal. It's like vibrations just moving so quickly. And oh, oh, oh another one's coming. Females come in. Pushed him off the rock. Doesn't look, doesn't look that impressed with him. <laughs> That's wonderful to see. Dippers are fantastic indicators of a healthy river system. To be able to survive, they need to eat lots of stoneflies, caddis and the odd fish, which all need clean and unpolluted water to thrive. Now one thing I've never really appreciated with common frogs before is that low grumble that the males make. And if you just listen, it's <laughs> Don't want to attract too many frogs to me. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Well, I'm going to get stuck into some frogs a bit more. Naturalist Jack Perks has been visiting this local robin population for years. Well, they've got this cute, and cuddly uh, persona, but that's really not the case. But the reality is they're incredibly aggressive little birds, particularly at this time when they're kind of defending their territories. But what about their lovely song? That sounds a very friendly, pretty, jolly song. So this time of year, they're pumped full of testosterone. They want to show that through their song. And that's to advertise that, you know, if you want to start a fight with me, I'm up for it. I'm, I'm ready. Well, let's go and see some. And in early winter, cameraman Jack Perks is irresistibly drawn to its shallows. I've been doing this for five years now, I come every year, it's almost like a, an annual pilgrimage. I'm just going to bung my polarizers on, see through the glare of the water. Now, some years can be better than others. So there's a... Whoa! <laughs> That's incredible. That's absolutely bonkers. It's thick with the roach. I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> this multitude is known as a bait ball because, wow, they're bait for a host of local predators. Bounty hunters like cormorants and grebes, sharpshooters like herons, egrets, and occasionally kingfishers, all trying to take their slice of the bait ball. But the real action is going on beneath the water. Oh, look at that! It's like a torpedo. Never get tired of seeing that, that's incredible. These are shy animals, and although the thick vegetation is great habitat for them, it makes spotting them incredibly difficult. It's a case of waiting, and that's what I've got to do now. Now, I've picked an area with lots of recent droppings. The water's slow down a bit. Waterfalls don't like fast water. So this is as good a place as any. I've just got to stick it out. Wildlife filmmaking is all about being patient, taking the time to enjoy what's around you, and it's also about accepting that what comes along might not be what you were hoping for. After three hours of waiting, oh, something's popping its head up and <laughs> it's a rat, okay. And this is where the confusion comes in because they do cohabitate. So bank voles, rats, all mixed with water voles by the riverside and people can easily get confused, but that is not what I'm after today. So I've come under this bridge because bridges are a great place to find animal tracks. Now there's a lot of sand that's come off the river and this is gonna be great for keeping those tracks nice and fresh and being able to tell what they are. Now there's some little spindly ones, little thin fingers. If I had to guess, I would say they're probably squirrels or rats. There's also a couple that look very fox-like. I can tell it's a fox because they've got four pads. But the one that I'm excited about are otter tracks and I can see what I think are a couple of otter tracks. I can tell that because they tend to have five pads and then you can also see just a slight indent of a claw. But the cherry on top is otter sprint and that's what I can find right here. Now, otter sprint is basically a fancy word for poo and otters use it as a way of communicating. Females will let others know when they're on heat, 
Males will use it to mark their territory. Think of it like a kind of otter Twitter, basically. Now, I'm told that otter spraying is meant to smell of jasmine, so I'm going to risk it. To be honest with you, it doesn't smell of jasmine, but it's not unpleasant. I wouldn't want it as an aftershave, don't get me wrong, but that is definitely otter spraying. So, I know there's an otter here. Grayling have got one of the most incredible breeding displays of any freshwater fish. As much fun as it is stood up here watching them, I want to get a closer view of them. So I want to get in the water and see them from their perspective. For me, a dry suit is essential workwear. Once you get past the cold water hitting your face, it's such an incredible experience seeing things from their point of view. I head for the edge of the current to see if there are any fish around. And sure enough, I spot the odd trout, including some lovely coloured rainbow trout. The Derbyshire Wye is one of the only rivers in the UK where these rainbows breed, but it's not them I'm after, and soon spot my quarry. They are gathering in the deeper water waiting for the shallows to warm up before spawning. Male grayling begin their courtship by vibrating next to the female to encourage her to lay eggs. And once sufficiently wooed, he lays his dorsal fin over her as she lowers down onto the gravels. Here, he fertilizes her eggs as they're laid. So I'm trying to just photograph the wildlife normally and, and avoid the plastic, but often it's, it's unavoidable. They're, they're eating it, they're, they're hunting in it, they're using it for their homes, and it's quite distressing to see. And the one that really sticks out in my mind was along a river in Norfolk, and we were trying to find otters in the day, which is hard enough anyway. Uh, but we did find this, this young, uh, young female, and she was fishing in amongst these sunken tree roots. And there was a huge buildup of plastic so she'd come out right next to it and then go fishing amongst it. So she was actually using that to find small fish because they were hiding along there. It was really saddening to see that this charismatic creature amongst all this litter. The red squirrel came round onto the bird feeders and then actually landed on the stick in front of me. I mean, I shouldn't be surprised that these things work, but I can't believe that worked. That was great. So ponds are great for amphibians in the springtime, but for the rest of the year, they're spending their time in the leaf litter. So when you're looking for somewhere to put the high binaculum, there's a couple of things you want to look out for. A nice sheltered area with a little bit of sunlight is ideal. It doesn't have to be right next to the pond, but the nearer the pond, the easier the access to the high binaculum. So we're more or less filled up now and the last thing to do is just have that insulating layer on the top. So we're doing that with lots of dead leaves, twigs, that's to just trap in the heat and that's going to be perfect for all the amphibians and reptiles. So let's, uh, let's get this all on there and then nearly done. It's looking cosy and warm. Yeah, I'm tempted to get in actually. Yeah? Yeah, I could sleep in that. Yeah, I think I'm going to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching. You can check out some other videos in the links here. Also check out my website and social media, as well as the podcast that I host, the Bearded Tits Podcast. Cheers.